Hello everyone and welcome back to That Time We Woke Up In A Podcast and Had To Explain Manga, our heated adventures over analyzing manga we find interesting, otherwise known as the Over Manga Cast. My name is Sam and we have been doing this for exactly one year. And in celebration of our one year anniversary of podcasting, we have gone back to where it started, One Punch Man by One and Yusuke Murata where we read chapters 78 through 95. Grab some birthday cake and enjoy the show. Guys, it's been a year. A whole ass year since our first episode. It it, it simultaneously feels like it's been forever to get here and like we just started. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> like yes. we haven't posted our hundredth episode yet. I'm, I'm sure that's something that a lot of people hear from things like this. But like, ha, like this is the first time I've experienced something like that. Like this is the first time I've you know been a part of something that's been put out there to the world, and I get that now. <laughs> time works weird when you create content, but uh, since it is our one hundred, no, not one hundred, not one hundredth <laughs> episode, not yet. <laughs> Since it is our one year anniversary, we're going back to where it began with one punch and did some one punch man. And as always, at the top of the episode, we like to talk about uh, our familiarity with the franchise. Um, In the past year, I actually haven't done that much with OPM. Yeah, that, like that's the long and short of it. Uh, I haven't read more of the manga until now. Uh, I didn't really watch season two. I just uh, bump the OPs every now and again, and that's about it. Uh, what about you, Matt? Uh, yeah, so I think I mentioned last time that uh, One Punch Man was one of the series I like keep up with regularly. Uh, that's a little less true now. I think I'm a few months behind, but still like pretty, uh, pretty up there. Uh, definitely about 100 chapters past where we're reading now. <laughs> uh, to give a little bit of a spoiler, uh, the, the most recent chapter I remember, um, well, not the most recent, but the most recent like fight they're in, uh, they finally got above ground. So... <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> to, t- to tell you how long this arc we didn't get to is um <laughs> oh my yeah we're th- it it's hilarious because we are so much better organized now it's night and day between our first episode and and uh the content we're about to bring you now and yet at the same time one punch man remains uh challenging in its own unique way <laughs> <laughs> look Murata can spend all all he wants drawing his beautiful two page spreads. That's uh, I love those. Yeah, <laughs> they're I very pretty, and I don't have to read uh, as much in this 150 page chapter. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh, Jay, how has your experience with One Punch Man changed over the past year? Um, not much, folks. Um, still haven't gotten too good at pacing. Um, as far as every time I work myself up to reading more One Punch Man, I'm always like, okay, this is another chapter, two chapters, and then starting to get overwhelmed again with how long some of these chapters can kind of drag on. But aside from that, uh, I haven't really kept up to date with, I think One Punch has had a season come out since we've started reading. Am I right or no? No. No, it's oh, actually no. famously the third season of the anime has not been talked about for a while now. <laughs> oh, geez. Considering the things that were said about the dramatic drop in quality for season two, that doesn't it makes me sad, but it doesn't shock me. Might have been an article criticizing the fact that there hadn't been a season three. There's been a lot of those popping up, yeah. which is odd during COVID because I'm like, it's COVID, guys. What can you do? <laughs> oh, we need wait, more hold, material hold, to binge. Hold on. Anime fans are like being uh, needy little children and not caring that uh, people have to make the things they love. Wow. We're uh, color me surprised. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I never would have seen this coming. So, uh, Jacob. <laughs> yeah. So actually, funnily enough, uh, I did have a slight... A change in my experience with One Punch Man because when we had first started the podcast, uh, I did actually read uh, several chapters into uh, the arc that we read this time. Then we started reading all of the other things that we've read over the course of this year, and that dropped like a stone. <laughs> 
So uh, I made a point of rereading everything again because it was literally a year ago. But I did actually a little bit into the first big fight. Like I saw the first couple of stages of I had, I had already read the first couple of stages of that before, uh, you know, my my slow reading pace had forced me into whatever we were currently doing. What we got to this time, uh, if you recall a year ago where we left off, uh, I believe that uh, Saitama had just punched Garo in the face and that didn't turn out too well for him. So our wannabe monster is off recuperating in an abandoned shack in the middle of nowhere, as you do. Mm -hmm. Also, the monsters. Oh, yeah, the Monster Association showed up and they kidnapped a kid and they declared war on humanity. And uh, the public's freaking out about that a little bit. Honestly, can't blame them. Yeah, it's uh, this is called the Monster Association arc, but it's uh, what we read is kind of like the prelude to it, but it's more Garo's arc. But it's also weird because the Monster Association arc started halfway between the tournament arc last time. Uh, One Punch Man is um, very, uh, it does what it wants. It, it yeah. does not stick to arcs very hard. Speaking speaking of uh, One Punch Man manages to be challenging for uh, basically any format, but a format <laughs> like ours, for example. It's less of a chain of arcs and more like a Venn diagram. It, yeah, actually, that's exactly <laughs> how I was going to put it. Get out of my head. <laughs> Get out of my head. Martial arts tournament was its own arc. The Monster Association attack was its own arc. And Garo was its own arc. As we transition into the start here, um, there is once again like three or four completely separate storylines that are all interwoven uh, simultaneously. And like the thing is that I, I actually really like that structure because it keeps every character relevant. It reminds you of, you know, everyone and, and their place in the story. It is fun to read as you're going through it, but it makes ma selecting a section of chapters to read for a finite podcast somewhat challenging. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All things are entirely arbitrary if you dig down deep enough, I suppose. <laughs> That is, that is absolutely true. So we picked an arbitrary chapter to end on, and that's what we did. But to start off, Garo is indeed recovering in a shack when um, some uh, schoolboys end up stumbling upon him. It had been their secret hideout. So they send the uh, the most timid one in to uh, get rid of the uh, weird old guy. Mm hmm. I love how later uh, when he keeps getting called old dude, uh, he he yells at the kid. I'm 18. <laughs> <laughs> that just oh. blew me away because like did we ever get any inkling of like because there's a lot of time skip uh i i don't think there i think he trains with the silver fang a very short amount of time because the whole impressive bit is like last year he participated in the martial arts tournament that's all the, you really know i would wager on that probably means he's more 19 because he entered that martial oh, actually he did it with a disguise so maybe he couldn't do it hmm I don't know. The timeline is weird. <laughs> the Litigating point... the timeline of One Punch Man is is its own interesting can of worms that is not really that fruitful. Yeah. The point being, uh, despite what these uh, kids say, Garo ain't that old. And uh, this timid one that was sent in, Taro, happens to be the little snot-nosed brat that Garo was chatting with on a park bench during the previous segment of reading. They talk for a bit because they're at least mildly acquainted when a bunch of hero hunter uh, hunters show up. The Hero Association has sent a squad to capture and or kill Garo. Which, uh, considering the talent they sent, uh, they are definitely favoring the latter. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why it's these particular heroes is that there is an open call on capture or kill Garo specifically because we don't have the monster association means that we don't have the time or resources that we'd normally have to get uh, to dedicate to dealing with a singular threat. And a bunch of a class heroes are like, we're going to show that the S class heroes aren't the only ones who matter. And uh, so they end up banding together and uh, trying to do the job yep. themselves. They certainly try. Uh, they drive away Taro's friends who abandon him because they're terrible small children. They're, yeah. they're kids. <laughs> Thankfully, Taro happens to be a bit of a hero nerd and has a guidebook, which... Uh, <laughs> that guidebook. I, I, I find this very funny. That is enough to give Garo an advantage. Or, or not necessarily an advantage, but enough of a finger hold to uh survive in the fight long enough for his 
Saiyan powers to kick in. <laughs> and we, uh, in any other series, I'd be pointing out how this is a flaw. Uh, but uh, in One Punch Man, this is clearly just the hero association being like horribly incompetent. That they print uh-huh. out a guidebook that lists their hero's weaknesses. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, like that that goes to something that we mentioned in uh, our very first episode, uh, like the uh, the issues with the Hero Association. They're running it like a business and like that's a PR move. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's stupid. That doesn't help people, especially since in, in this in this universe. Obviously, the reason we even have heroes is because, wait, did heroes originate in response to monsters specifically, or was it crime related? One caused the other, but they jumped up at the same time because there's been like a arms race going on. Because um, when we got the flashback last time with Saitama, like Crab Man was a pretty strong one, but still he was something like regular Saitama without superpowers could take out. Mm-hmm. Like... So it's like there has been an arms race of the monsters have been getting stronger and stronger, but also the humans have been getting stronger and stronger. Okay. Um, All of it's been happening within like three years. I guess what my point is, it makes sense initially why they started having these books, because it is a marketing campaign. But at the time, you know, the threat was not as obvious. Yeah. And and that actually also is is a bit of the same thing, because like the the problem with the Heroes Association, the incentives have been corrupted by the changing times. Like it's a that's a very uh, real world element to one punch because, like you know, like what is the point of parody? It's to, you know, point something out. The elements of the Hero Association are parodying issues that real world governments have. And like as times have changed Things that made sense in the past are being maintained off of pure momentum because the gov- if the government has anything, it's, it's momentum and very little else. <laughs> Sometimes that's good. Other times it causes people who go like because like, you know, like at the start, you know, someone's weakness being bullets or something like it doesn't matter that you print the weaknesses of, um, you know, basically a guy with a gimmick in a funny track suit. But mm-hmm. once you have people who have straight up superpowers, printing weaknesses suddenly becomes a problem. And that hasn't really been addressed with the changing times, partially because times have changed so fast, but also because the Hero Association hasn't, you know, had the impetus to change. So they've not bothered to make the effort. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Anyway, the, the group of heroes we get assigned here are all honesty, Death Gatling and um, uh, um, Megan Singer. D- Meg- also, St- D- uh, Death Gatling, Stinger, and Megane are the only ones who are really important. Yeah, uh, mainly Blam because... Blam's also there. Oh, you're right. Blam Blam is my favorite trope Blam Blam. in uh, superheroes, where someone's superpower is owning a gun. Which, um, <laughs> uh, if uh, if anyone's ever played Masks, uh, one of my favorite characters. <laughs> Uh, I didn't intend this at the time, but ended up uh, his superpower was he just owned a gun, <laughs> and. Uh, it's useful for a lot of things. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, he, he's got a gun. There you go. All right, jokes on us, I guess. Yep. I mean, if it works, I just started blasting. <laughs> well, I mean, that is blam blam. <laughs> but they've actually got he's a... the cowboy, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, he's the cowboy, not we... shooter. That's the archer. Yeah, yeah. Which is very confusing, but we'll get to that. Their names are probably confusing on purpose because they're joke characters. That, yeah, that is the joke. Because the because the only you know like they are all they are all joke characters except for Death Gatling actually has things to say to Garo. Stinger uh, Garo uses as an object lesson, and uh, Stinger's also got a bit of pre build up in the story because he's showed up a few times. I, hmm. I know he was in the Sea King arc and. Yep. Uh, Meg- some other points. M- Megan A as well. He's the one who um, quit the Blizzard group after Saitama mm-hmm. or Saitama saved them because the Blizzard group just bullied him out. And he's like, hey, you can be a hero. And I think this is he's doing like the Saitama style route of like he's in a tracksuit and just like using his real name as his hero name because Saitama really impressed on him, which is what the takeaway is there is that it's just yeah. like I, I, I like that and- in one punch is like these things are happening in the background. They don't really feel the need to. To explain them in detail. And in all honesty, the other sort of fun thing is that uh, Megane is actually one of the most competent of the group. Uh, You know, he he ditches the gimmicks and just does, you know, does hero things. And it works out for him until uh, until uh, Garo gets his Zenkai boost and yeah, Super Saiyans all over them. But we'll get to that. (laughs) 
I, I just gotta say, Megan A, uh, I really appreciated him in this. He's a fun character. He uh, did a good job in the fight. I, every time I looked at him, I just thought, discount Ida. <laughs> Oh my god, I thought the same thing. I was gonna say strong Eda energy. Get out of my head! <laughs> we're not gonna beat by beat this fight because it's a long fight. It's one punch, man. I don't think we're gonna beat by beat any of the fights. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really long. It's really, really, really cool. Check it out yourself. It's worth the time. Yeah, It's, an, it's a time investment, but it's worth it. <laughs> The important part is this brings up that, and we're just going to keep making DBZ references with uh, Garo, but it's hard not to because he is uh, a giant DBZ reference. Let's be honest. Yeah. He practically has uh, Ultra Instinct, or at the very least, he gets hit by an attack and then he just doesn't get hit by it again because he knows how to deal with it. It's a non licensed version of uh, Zenkai Boost meets Ultra Instinct, is what it is. Mm -hmm. Which is cool. Uh I mean,. <laughs> I thought that was um, a technique from the uh, water crushing rock school, I think. Is that, like, well, that's why it's yeah, not a licensed yeah. version of that. But yeah. Yeah, it's it's reacting to your because that entire thing is reacting to your opponent's moves and using that momentum against them. And also mm -hmm. apparently using the air to slice people like blades because both he and Silver Fang do that. Isn't that Silver Fang's brother? That, yeah, that's it. I'm pretty sure that's a different like martial arts school. Ah, oh, I thought Silver Fang also cuts people with. Well, I Garo knows it because Garo memorizes every technique he sees with one. Go. Yeah, Garo yeah. Garo uses it, but I don't think uh, Silver Fang does. Okay. Um, because like there's a there's like a visual effect that's used to. I mean, like the sequential art of Garo's oh, yeah. fighting style yep. is absolutely breathtaking. Uh, like, Murata goes insane that, with Garo, and I love it. Murata goes insane, period, because <laughs> you'll you'll get sequential art where it's like, hey, you could totally keep the character in the same pose and just have things around it. No, let's do a different camera angle for no reason. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And, like, um, one of the things that they'll do that makes Garo's uh, fighting style look so amazing these lines tracing where his hands are going and showing how he's like redirecting the energy of his opponent's mm -hmm. attacks away from his body and he uses this to slowly dismantle the enemy and it shows that you know he's not just brute force even though he's got a whole bunch of that he's also very clever when it comes to uh, getting in the minds of his enemies, particularly because uh, what he does is he uh, manages to catch Magane, basically just toying with him, beating on him without defeating him. And this incenses Stinger enough to go in, to like recklessly go in, which lets Garo defeat Stinger. And like, that's just one example, but he does this constantly throughout the entire fight. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Well, because the entire fight is um at one point he gets poisoned and like he's starting to lose consciousness and like, just weary and every time we get his internal monologue it's like if i do not like play this perfectly i am going to die because these people are not looking to take me alive that there is no like claim of that there's he, yep. there's also a really common refrain refrain that was the strongest in this fight but was something that goes through all of it um and this is actually a really interesting running theme that i really liked about garo's story is um like he he mentions things in his head like if this was a sequence of one-on-one -on -one fights i'd already be walking away from it they are ganging up on me because they know they can't beat me one-on-one -on -one. and they're calling themselves the heroes the kind of unfairness that gets uh thrown on garo's head i think it's in this first fight it might be in the one with Genos, but I'm pretty sure it's in this fight where he has a flashback to his childhood. Like we get a scene where he's like, uh, like everyone's talking about the hero justice man killed a crab monster or something. And yeah. Garo points out, well, the crab monster was just defending the ocean. And if it wasn't three on one, he actually would have survived. You know, doesn't, doesn't the monster get any credit for the effort that he put in? And the sort of important element to all of this is we don't know for sure if the monster was like a, a innocent victim who the hero system unfairly labeled as the bad guy. But Garo's story, what it does really well is it examines protagonist privilege because mm -hmm. we see we see all of the bad monsters, sure, but we don't see all of the monsters. And Garo points out nobody's asking them their motivations. You know, you see one bad monster and it's like, OK, they're all bad. That's the reason why he's doing what he's doing. And the and like 
Garo is rightly seeing the inherent injustice in the system that exists, but he also overtly notes that he he doesn't really understand why it's wrong. Like, and that's why he's turning himself into a villain in spite of being right about the system being wrong. Yeah, and I think like protagonist privilege is like a really good use of that because there's also like a level of um when he was mentioning the crab man, he's just like, well, yeah, but the crab man was literally about to finish Justice Man off, but like at the last second he lucked out into something and like uh, there was a lightning bolt that hit yeah. the crab <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, and, it's, and it's like oh man he would have won because overall like 99 times out of 100 he would have won that fight but because justice man is the protagonist he eked out that one percent chance victory and that was more compelling but then the argument is like well yeah but the monster was still the more competent fighter isn't that cool my favorite line from garo from little garo in the background is uh when he says i can't imagine how frustrating it must be for the crab demon to know that if it was just a little bit stronger it would have won and he's comparing himself to that in the in that moment that hit me <laughs> mm-hmm to a shocking degree so yeah. yeah and i mean like not not to get too real world with one punch man but you know part of you know part of what parody is is shining a light on something and sometimes that can be the real world you could substitute hero and monster with other things in the world uh especially circa the um, the monsters are always considered the bad guys and the heroes are always considered the good guys. You know, Garo is right to see the injustice in that because he's not taking the time to think about why things are wrong, a more constructive way of doing things. It's like he's he's taking all these extreme methods. Everyone knows he's there. Everyone's listening to him, but he doesn't really know what he has to say. And the reason why he's not the main character, the reason he's not the good guy is because what he's doing isn't really helping his cause because he doesn't know what it is quite yet. I mean, I think even in universe, uh, you can <laughs> switch one out for the other because I think it's pretty clear Garo said he kept saying hero and monster, but he was like the inherent injustice that the popular rich kid always got preferential treatment and because yeah. he was an outsider. Yeah. Like, like That's... he misattributed his bullying <laughs> to like this <laughs> fantasy and then proceeded to gain superpowers. So unfortunately... <laughs> <laughs> you didn't really get to deal with that trauma in a constructive way. Um, there, there is, there is an element of writing the quiet part out loud, but yeah, no, and I, like I really like that because it makes because like Garo is cool for his fighting style, but the reason I personally found him so compelling is that's a real thing that happens to people, and I, I mm -hmm. want to, I want to see, uh, you know, Garo be like, the hero he's obviously meant to be, and I'm, I'm concerned that he legitimately might not make it. You know, and that's that's and, really uh, compelling. Yeah. And the the thing about misattributing his bullying, you know, comes through a lot, particularly later in our reading. But uh, when he in his attempts to be a monster keeps unintentionally saving this small child. <laughs> this is another thing that we mentioned in the last section of One Punch Man is that the hero association, when it's being a hero association and not a business helps people when Saitama isn't looking for a good challenging fight and just helping people this the thing that he started out doing you know he's the shining hero he always uh, meant to be and Garo is another example of this where you know he's so close but like ships passing in the night quite mm -hmm. finding you know the truth at the heart of the matter this is all happening during the fight with the uh a as he's being hero poisoned squad. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Which, the, uh, the flashback gives him his uh, I don't know if it's a second wind, because I think I think starting the fight was already Gar a second wind. He gets Garo gets about 20 winds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> reading. Yeah, the, the poison also is constantly there because uh, that's also what kind of wraps up the fight is um, he kind of realizes that he's lost so much mobility. He can't just like take these people one by one like he was planning to. And that's when he starts using their attacks against each other and like putting them in the way of their cooperation, using their numbers against them. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I mean, like Death Gatling, his superpower is also gun. He has a Gatling gun for an arm. He can't spray at Garo when Garo is an arm's reach away from a bunch of other of the heroes. His superpower is more gun. <laughs> it does eventually come down to just uh, Death Gatling and Garo because everyone else is defeated. And Death Gatling's like, well, I'm just going to unleash my gun on you now. So uh, it kind of sucks that you rinsed everybody else, but I'm going to win in the long run. So 
Uh, good night, Garo. Wait, don't shoot me. There's a kid in the shed behind. Is that really the best you got? Die. So with then Garo proceeds to deflect bullets with his supposedly non-superpowered <laughs> body. Oh, Def- no, his, his body was always superpowered. Yeah. <laughs> deflect well, a bolt the heavy from Team Fortress 2. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's parodying what Demon Slayer does. Technically, the Demon Slayers are humans without superpowers, despite the fact that they very clearly do things that no real world human could ever do. That's that's where Garo is right now. He's he's so deep into Charles Atlas superpowers. It's farcical to say he doesn't have superpowers. Some yep. martial arts uh, mysticism thrown on top, because that is how he's deflecting the bullets. Yeah, by, like he's able to deflect Death Gatling's attack. And uh, Death Gatling is so uh, shocked by this, he's stalled long enough that Garo can knock him out, too. Also ran out of bullets. He ran out of bullets, so he pulls out a sword, but that doesn't work against Garo for obvious reasons. And uh, Garo's like, well, that was a, that was sure a day. I'm going to go leave now. And then uh, Gino shows up out of nowhere. <laughs> really cool thing is it was actually Megane uh, who had uh, hit the... Um, the emergency transceiver that they had been giving out to all the people in the Hero Association because of Garo. Uh, mm-hmm. The other A-listers did not want to do that because they wanted to prove they could do it for themselves. This is actually another really cool example of um, tying into something that we mentioned last time. The A-list heroes are rightly pointing out that just because the s rank heroes are powerful and good in direct combat doesn't mean that they're the only heroes that matter. But their problem is their solution is to just try to be more powerful, which kind of goes against the entire point that you're making. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I I think they're trying to leverage themselves so that they can be in a position of power to be heard. I mean, at least that's what I was trying to factor into. Like no one's listening to us because they think that because we're not powerful, that we have nothing to contribute. Well, how are we going to force them to listen other than being impactful? Yeah, and they mm-hmm. and they set about it in the wrong way because they basically just try to be better than the S-Class heroes at what the S-Class heroes are good at and instead of playing to their own strengths, which is very similar to the situation that Garo is in in a lot of ways. It's, it's another really good example of um, the lower-ranked heroes do have value. They're the tacticians. You know, people like Moomin Rider work on street-level crime, and that's really important, especially right now. But these A-rank heroes are basically just trying to prove that they have value by doing what S-rank heroes can do, even though... You know, they're not they don't have the same skill set. Like, it's real easy to just run into a situation and block everything when your body is literally made out of um, impervium. But like, (laughs) yeah. Uh, turns out when you're a lower rank, you need to think about things and have a tactical mindset, which actually the A rank kind of did. But their tactical mindset was we're all going to kill him from different angles. We talked about the the heroes that were the ones that were more important and, and less of joke characters because... Megane was actually doing it exactly right, basically. You know, he knew what his skill set was and he played to it and he made it a point of not letting himself be a liability. It wasn't until Garo had basically got everyone else's numbers that he was able to shut that down. Then Stinger and Death Gatling, in two completely different ways, completely missed the mark and were object lessons in why the A rank heroes were doing it. It's almost like one of the running themes of One Punch Man is good intentions not always leading to good results. Yeah. <laughs> and and you need to, you know, maybe reevaluate what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, speaking of uh, S-Ranks just being able to walk into a situation and clown their way through everything without really <laughs> trying, uh, Garo <laughs> gets walloped because not only is a uh, good boy Genos there putting on a show, although Genos even does say, I only have so long for this fight. I need other, th- I've got to go, I'm needed other places. Like, uh, so I'm going to have to clean this up quickly. Can't play around. Uh, also, Bang and Bomb are there, so it's a it's a three effectively S rank, but uh, Bomb obviously not a superhero. So mm-hmm. he's is he retired or was he just not he's a, a hero? He, he's a martial artist. He uh, the martial arts industry as a whole thinks being a hero is kind of flashy and unnecessary for it. Kind of cheapens their art, which yeah. is why. Um, it's something uh, they had to work and craft and hone, mm-hmm. and was not something they work just inherently had and are not trying to look to commercialize yeah it, it was a it was a through like kind of through line through the uh, martial arts martial, arc. yeah okay yeah that, that yeah. i i do recall that now that you mentioned my lifestyle is not for sale 
That's like <laughs> that's like what the main antagonist of that arc kept saying was, "Ah, heroes are dumb." The guy who uh, beat everybody in one kick. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. One I, kick. We we get my uh, favorite panel of Genos, which is also my favorite animated clip of Genos. You've all seen it from the memes. It's the one of him just standing up like the <laughs> Undertaker with a jetpack. I don't know why it's so funny. I think it's just the fact that he stops like all momentum just halts when he's perfectly vertical. <laughs> they took him a uh, like stiff board falling over backwards and reversed it at high speed. But um, uh, there, there's another cool fight. Genus gets a little clever on Garo, uh, almost incinerates him a few times. Uh, as Matt said, uh, bang and bombs show up and start walloping on him. And we get yeah, the uh, last the last time Garo avoids becoming flame broiled. It's because um, bang punches him out of the way, because as my student, I am the one who must atone for your your crimes, which I mean, again, <laughs> screwed up incentives messing with. the. Uh... I mean, if you want to like do a more morbid twist on it, say. It's my dog. I got to put it down. It really do I mean, be I like mean, that. Kind of, yeah. I mean, Garo even put the um, wolf hat on like <laughs> rabid dog is very on brand for him. Yep. He knows what he's about. And I appreciate that about him. Mm hmm. Anyway, Garo uh, keeps getting clothing knocked off of him during these fights. I know. <laughs> no, that strategically, I, 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 it's delicious. I love it. <laughs> it, it, it. It is something. It is something. I but, see um, what you're doing here. <laughs> Garo has another flashback basically reiterating how freaking unfair is this? I beat a half dozen A rankers while injured and poisoned by myself. And then two S ranks and someone who could be S rank if he was a hero showed up. And now they're all ganging up on me. What? This, this Whilst I'm still poisoned and beaten half to death. Bullshit. And he enters this super rage mode where... <laughs> One of his eyes becomes basically permanently bloodshot. He breaks free from uh, their like final finishing move. And it looks like, okay, this is his like fifth or sixth wind. Uh, Let's just finish this off. And the big thing is this like last push from Garo was this is the closest he actually came to being resigned to his fate. And he was basically saying, I'm going to go down swinging, but I know I don't stand a chance this time. It's going to happen this time. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's able but, to, um, he's able to put it on a shocking show, but there, uh, the heroes are like, yep, that's it. But, uh, the monster association has plans for him. So Phoenix man snatches him away. Yeah. They send, they send a bunch of people through a tunnel, uh, to, uh, help him out who all get, uh, uh, promptly eliminated by, uh, mostly Genos, but then eventually, uh, Phoenix man who has been watching over, uh, the entire, uh, conflict swoops in and grabs Garo to his great chagrin because uh, he was resigned to his fate. He didn't want help. <laughs> he wasn't happy about what was going on, but... Yeah, Garo repeatedly has said he thinks the concept of a monster association is stupid. Uh, not only that, when he is rescued by Phoenix Man, Phoenix Man decides to make a loud announcement to everyone that Garo is part of the monster association. <laughs> <laughs> we at the Monster Association are not going to let such a promising new recruit go so easily. What the hell are you talking about? You are now in the Monster Association. Come with me. Shut the hell up. Put me back. I wasn't <laughs> done with them yet. It's like, OK, well, we can't reach that high. I feel like it's less Garo is rabbit and more Garo is a chihuahua. I don't know. Mm. He, he he has strong small dog energy. But the thing is, he's I mean, not small. In fact, I think that's he gets true. taller in some respects. He's a he he he's a small dog that that becomes large. He he, he gets buffer <laughs> somehow as he keeps getting beat. But up. I also <laughs> can't like argue that he's like a chihuahua where he's like super hyper focused on one aspect. He seems to have a broad conceptual realization that this world that we exist in is messed up. So I can't even say like he's hyper focused and is just super pissed about something that's inconsequential and very narrow. So I don't know if I can say he's like an angry chihuahua. I think he has angry chihuahua energy, though. I don't I don't disagree with your assessment. That is fair. But uh, (laughs) anyway, uh, before they can chase after Phoenix Man uh, with their three man uh, S rank team, uh, the Monster Association plays their big card, which is um, 
yet another centipede. <laughs> yes, uh, Senta, <laughs> Senta, Senta Ichiro, Sen- Tichiro. Sen- Sentichiro, Shinchorio, I think. I don't know. Sentichoro? Yeah, sen- Sentichoro, yeah, that sounds it's, right. It's a giant churro. El- Elder Centipede was the other one. This is the other one. Or maybe he is Elder Centipede. I forget. I don't know. Elder Centipede <laughs> died. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, okay. So he is the other one. And uh, he has been summoned. He is even bigger. And uh, they have... He is a threat rank dragon and is being released right now because... Um, he got a grudge. Blast. Yeah, it's Blast who had yeah. Blast had defeated him in the past. Yes. And that's the only hero who had ever even fought even with him. So he wanted uh, revenge. Mm-hmm. Well, it's I- actually he's running reconnaissance because um, apparently the monster organization wants Genos or not Genos. Um, Genos was the name of the person I, I was. I, I had said Garo too many times. I couldn't remember Genos's name. Was, but, uh, was trying to run reconnaissance on um, Garu and they were trying to get him out of there because they're like, this fight is going on way too long. And we want you to like we want him alive. Mm-hmm. So that's why they summon. Hey, what? don't worry about him. He's got it. They also hey. summoned um, Sentichiro specifically because uh, they determined Genos was too weak to pierce his skin, and that Bang and Blast, or specifically, um, there are only like ba- four four heroes that could defeat him theoretically, yeah. or and or six or something. With um, Bang in particular being exceptionally weak against him because his martial arts is more for human shaped opponents. Mm-hmm. So, like, Human-shaped. this was an ideal scenario for taking out two S ranks. If you if you were to talk about like raw like power like like tiers of power four of the participants were about the same but uh the skill set of the three heroes was antithetical to fighting uh Sentichir- uh Sentichiro. big bug i'm just gonna call it the big bug <laughs> <laughs> which is probably unfortunate the monster association was unaware that bang and bomb have a secret laser power move <laughs> The, their super key combining move. <laughs> look, look, where they combine their two schools: the flowing water and crushing rock, and the the one that Bomb uses. It, it it's the choppity chop one. It's the choppy that, chop wind one. Look, the formation that the two of them take with uh uh Genos in the front. So like Genos uses his like weapons to hold the thing off while they you know gather their power uh uh to do the attack <laughs> that that two page spread was really cool okay my my favorite oh, two page yeah. spread in this is um Genos getting his legs ripped off in the air and you're like oh no Genos is gonna have to be re- re- rebuilt again nope booster rockets reconnects back to his legs to kick the centipede in the face <laughs> <laughs> It's a great gag because uh, Genos literally just got done getting repaired from the last time he got his ass handed to him. He is fresh out of Dr. Kusuno's lab in this fight. We we had so a scene like, of um, Dr. Kusuno being like, well, I've been awake for 36 hours. I'm going to go nap. And Genos is like, I'm sorry, I will not bother you again. No, it's fine. Just don't be reckless. Proceeds to fling himself down the throat of the giant centipede so he can unleash his hyper explosion cannon on the end. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Bang and Bomb's super key blast move. They punch Sentichoro in the face with it, and it unleashes a crackling burst of energy that will cause the shell to explode, and the exoskeleton will be destroyed, and this will be the end of the monster, and oh, it it's getting bigger. It molted. Oh my god, it molted. <laughs> and it's got the best reaction image. It's just a zoom in on Silver Fang's face. <laughs> just, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like I'm in a gag manga or something. Uh, nah. But but don't worry. They, these three S ranks just caused a whole bunch of problems. We need someone who can handle this. We need the strongest human. King comes up with a megaphone and calls Sentichiro out. <laughs> calls him a bitch. Like literally. <laughs> he comes up and says, aren't you the little baby who peed himself after Blast kicked your butt last time? <laughs> why, why don't you go home uh, crying and suck your mama's <laughs> Are you going to pee and poop yourself this time? <laughs> I got Blast right over here if you're not scared. What? <laughs> he, he called you a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that causes uh, Sentichiro to charge. Because he is very much not a bitch. 
to let you know yeah. that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, this was indeed the plan. But then um, King starts to get a little bit nervous because. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean the King engine is roaring the, as the he King faces down. The King starts roaring. <laughs> <laughs> There's like there's like four or five pages of uh, Sentichiro just getting closer to King with nothing happening except for the King <laughs> engine. And then and the then inevitable like, punchline, quite literally. And the King's like, uh, Saitama, it's getting really close. Serious punch! If you like two page spreads, there's five of them right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> five entire two page spreads of Saitama's fist going forward with another syllable of serious sponge. I mean, oh. you want to you want to talk about the Kamehameha being a attack from a joke manga then but actually like turning into something cool. Those like multiple two page spreads of that whole like uh, Sentichiro getting closer and then Saitama doing the serious punch attack. That was cool. <laughs> that was really cool so, and it it's so cool because uh saitama just utterly like disintegrates sentichiro with it and he's disintegrating but because he's so long when they're having the conversation with each other after he's been defeated you can see his body is still disintegrating in the background <laughs> <laughs> i love it dear listeners i think it's very important that we mention this this whole thing, this uh, the A-listers fight, uh, Gina showing up, Bang and Bomb, Saitama. This is all one chapter. Yep. Yep. It's 140 pages long. <laughs> <sighs> I, I don't I don't want to know what Murata put himself through to do. Oh, you, can, you can follow Murata on Twitter. He'll uh, he'll post his quotas for the day. And when he's happy, he's met them. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, like, once again, there's a reason why we selected an arbitrary number of chapters. <laughs> we all had some fun adventures getting the reading done for this episode. <laughs> Congratulations. Sentacharo is defeated. We have finished the first major fight of this uh, reading and now uh, we still have to deal with the fact that um, the monster association kidnapped a child specifically the child of one of the big wigs at the hero association so uh, yeah we need to deal with that do we have any s-class heroes on it uh, well we can't contact king bang or demon cyborg and metal knight is being a little bit hey, metal knight you want to come help <laughs> it is Fine. illogical okay so like matt i know you've read further and i don't know if uh you would know if this theory has any uh any legs to stand on i wouldn't tell you if it did uh, yeah exactly <laughs> but like i'm wondering if metal knight is more involved with this arc than uh is being let on there's a character who who shows up when we uh start meeting like the members of the monster association if you remember all metal knight did in the last arc too he was in was basically he showed up to gather pieces of boros's spaceship because they looked cool did not stay to help um, <laughs> so uh, as far as s-class heroes go metal knight is kind of a, a dark horse it's not even like king where he where king is just so strong like most of the times he doesn't come is because it's not worth his time <laughs> it's funny. I'm not 100% sure how many people know for sure that King is, isn't actually the strongest. Cause, like, I'm not sure how many people in Saitama's group know that. Because that's, no, that's exactly what I'm saying. Does Genos know? Does Bang know? Does Bomb know? I do not know. <laughs> I think they really, I personally don't think they know. It's like I don't think Saitama to like has told them. And yeah, yeah. I, and, and if people could figure it out that easily, then the joke wouldn't work. So, like, I think I think because it's funnier, I'm pretty sure that only Saitama knows. But it's one of those ones where it's like, come on. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, that is the joke, but that is the joke. Is it supposed to be so hilariously obvious to us and Saitama? And that's it. I think it gets to the point <laughs> that you are gonna have to have the running because I know this is in the fan theory, the running theory that King actually does have a superpower and it's like a low level intimidation aura. It just makes yeah. him feel threatening to people. So people just assume that's like, oh, yeah. it's actually that scar on his face. So it's like. And he got the scar literally as he was caught in the crossfire of another fight. So it's not even. Saitama's mm. fight. Yeah. He has taken credit for everything for... Saitama has done. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty great. Well, in exchange, 
I get to come over to your house whenever I want. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And beat his ass in video games. I don't know who's benefiting more from that relationship or if either of them are. They seem happy, though, so uh, it's fine, I guess. It's good for Saitama to have friends, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, speaking of the other S-Class heroes, we also get an update that uh, Drive Knight, the other robotic um, uh, Mm S-Class, apparently went ahead on a scouting mission and they have not heard from him. And I think we even get a scene of him getting captured or well, that might have been last time. No, there was a there was a thing where uh, I think it's the character with the funky eye like shows a hologram of Drive Knight going in and then like the uh, feed getting cut out. And like that mm-hmm. was the last contact that they had with him because they don't know for sure. Like they don't know where he is They're They're sort of he he's currently MIA. They're assuming he's dead if not captured, but there's still technically a chance that he's like undercover somewhere or something. Beca- because I, th- they think he's dead because he's missed his report in is a thing. Yeah. Like, yeah, signs point to he didn't make it. Indeed. Silver Fang, was it? I mean, his transmitter got destroyed. And so they legitimately mentioned like, oh, we haven't heard from him either. And he's mm-hmm. just like, oh, yeah, my transmitter got destroyed. Plus Sorry. he's an old yeah, man. Good. He's got, he's got to he's got to lie down on a hard floor because when he never does he threw that, out his can... back. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of cases where uh, those transmitters get broken because uh, kings mysteriously disappeared. How about that? I mean, <laughs> they're equivalently like just walkie talkies. They I really think King are. broke his. <laughs> oh yeah, no, King definitely <laughs> broke his a hundred percent. Yeah, no, he he chucked that out of the window the instant he got it. <laughs> Let's yep. be honest. But um, uh, we also get our our, our good boy uh, a my mask, who we know from last reading, uh, had I his concert him. interrupted. I hate I him so much. Oh, I, I because I, he's I, pretty boy because pretty boy, and I that love, is I what? love a my mask. <laughs> of course that, you do. Yeah, I, I I I love people with confidence and the skills to back it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> skills. He has. We've always hedged on him about to use his skills have we ever seen him use his skills no he always uses his skills off screen because he's a professional okay (laughs) i i love how i love how everyone has a a different reaction to it because to me uh uh a my mask ah the walking embodiment of the uh the metaphor of the uh corrupted incentives of the hero association i love this character (laughs) <laughs> like <laughs> oh i mean he's a good he's a good character he creates good scenes and uh is a fun addition to any uh dynamic he's just a bitch and i hate him <laughs> and he's not even decent like eye candy i mean really he looks pretty generic he's also um he's also part of the deification of the s class because yeah, he, yeah. Mm-hmm. he he doesn't want them becoming like some kind of like group anybody can get into which is why he's purposefully staying at the top of a tier it's the same thing blizzard is doing with b tier yeah Mm. yeah or had been because she is changing that now after her interactions with saitama Mm -hmm. slowly but changing her attempts to create the new blizzard bunch are um She's very determined. <laughs> I feel like Blizzard's involvement in this section of the reading spun its wheels. It is clearly character development, but they also did. They played the same joke four times in a row with her. And uh, by the end of it, it wasn't it oh. wasn't even that I wasn't enjoying it. It's like, OK, yep, this joke again. Got it. <laughs> J- Jacob, I, I find it amazing that you have so much faith in Murata that you think that Blizzard just isn't being included because it's very clearly his favorite character to draw. <laughs> I mean, could you tell? I, I could tell. I, I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. Look, there, there, there might also be author appeal associated with the character, but I'm, I'm reading this from the context of its uh, literary merits. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, the, the one scene we do get with uh, Blizzard, I really like in this. Um, it's cutting a bit forward, but this entire thing is basically just a whole bunch of uh, little vignettes to see where everyone's at currently. Mm -hmm. Um, people have been slowly gathering in Saitama's apartment, so he goes out to just get away from them. So he goes to a restaurant. Mood. 
Yep. Realizes he forgot his wallet just as he's finishing his meal. And he's like, oh, no. And then they've got like, don't worry, we have professional heroes on staff to stop Dine and Dashers. He's like, oh, oh no. no. <laughs> and then as luck would have it, um, Blizzard has been trying to track him down and talk to him. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sit down. Yeah, jo join. Uh, a large order of fries, please. He could yeah, have gotten have a, a small order of fries. That's the worst thing. <laughs> here, here, Blizzard, have a fry. Oh, thank you. Uh, anyway, so is I he wanna... actually listening to me now? <laughs> I've noticed me. Somebody. <laughs> and it's uh, just so great because the second he gets a oh, because Garo shows up at there, that same restaurant. Uh -huh. Yeah, he that after his beat down, he's hungry. Yeah, that, yeah that, the, um... I, I see that cuts. A, uh, <laughs> there's an entire chunk with Garo. We skip over to get to this point. But um, well, there, I fine. mean, that's a relatively short thing because he wakes up at the Hero Association, calls them a bit and leaves. Monster so, Association. Monster Association. I mean, he would also do the same thing at the Hero Association. <laughs> but. And then uh, to to recover from his wounds, he wanted uh, the the most protein rich uh, meal that he could get. So he goes into a, a family diner, orders every steak that they have and all of the water. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun yeah. little scene. And then he just walks out because, of course, he does. Hey, he's... Dino Dasher, Saitama. I haven't even done it yet. I mean, get back here, villain. Fubuki, you ate a fry, so the bill's on you. What? <laughs> How petty. <laughs> and it's great because Saitama even like internally doesn't accept that logic. <laughs> he's just going through an entire thing of like, I I dine and dashed. What what am I even doing? And like I'm so sorry. To the point that Garo decides to fight him because he's like, oh, I guess he's a hero. I'll just take him out real quick. So Gar Saitama is embarrassed of his hero name. Yep, and Saitama doesn't say his hero name. And then is also like, I don't want to identify myself because I dine and dashed. And if you try and fight me, we're going to draw attention. And then they're going to know I also dine and dashed. So please, let's not. And then he takes him out real quick and Garo's unconscious. <laughs> and he's just like, I'm going to leave. I'm so embarrassed. Yeah, Saitama, Saitama's walking away and he offhand backhands Garo. <laughs> Garo decides to uh, fight Saitama specifically because in the scene that we kind of skipped over where he called the Monster Association and left is um, he walked in right as Mr. Begwig had sent in a team of uh, paramilitary, essentially, with the power suits. I think the anti-work people from the first reading had. Sam, um, these people are dead within the same panel yeah. they show up. It doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> <laughs> it, do it doesn't matter. They go from ending a chapter looking real cool to showing off each by the character stuff. like you're supposed to remember what they look like as if these idiots are going to mm. last more than one page. To being captured by the Monster Association, begging for their lives and being made the mind slaves of the BDSM monster, which is the scene Garo walks in on. Uh, Orochi, the Monster King, is like, I will only accept you as a monster if you bring me the head of a hero. I literally don't care which one it is. Girl's like, that's lame. Bye. Or Orochi doesn't say that. Gyo Gyo says that. Gyo Oro uh, Giro Giro says that on behalf of Orochi, because ostensibly ah. Orochi is the leader, because he's the strongest. Yes, ostensibly, but also... Yeah, it's, pre it's pretty clear that's not the case. Almost yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it was kind of weird with the way it was paneled because it was showing Orochi's face. But... I think Orochi does say something close to that, but it's obvious who's really calling the shots. And uh, the one of the important bits is uh, Garo's not killed anybody. Mm -hmm. He's not killed he... a single human and he has yet to even kill a monster. He's not killed anything yet. And he hasn't even realized he's been doing that like sparing people and just putting them in the hospital like he he's been doing that reflexively because i don't know maybe he has a strong heroic reflex he doesn't know about or something and then the other thing is uh i mentioned earlier the the bit with uh maybe metal knight is doing more than it seems there's a there's another like new member monster high level monster in the monster association who is uh machine god machine god who apparently has some of metal knight's parts grafted onto his uh machine body and I, and just given the way that he talks i kind of wonder if that might not be metal knight in disguise because uh he also tends to not actually finish people off he's pretty much the reason why they handed the mercenaries to the bdsm monster and Instead of just straight up killing them. Garo gets soundly beaten by Saitama because of course he does. <laughs> because it and, because uh, this is still one punch man. <laughs>
And when Garo wakes up, he he had actually run into Teiro again, uh, who was like, why did you fight that hero? And it's like, I fight heroes because I'm a monster kid. And then uh, two other monsters from the Monster Association are like, oh, are you? Then why didn't you kill that hero? Kill that child. No. No. <laughs> Okay, we're going to kill you then. Oh, what's it? It's and it's like uh, King the Ripper and um, Insect God. Yep. <laughs> it's just a really buff Scyther. And I mean, King the Ripper is literally just um, a dude like, with swords for hands. Yeah, it's um, it's, it's like a, a Japanese horror monster is a thing. Like it's it's very clearly a reference. I just can't yeah. remember what their name is. We got the hero named King and now we have Ke- the monster King the Ripper. This won't get confusing. They mostly call him Ripper. Yeah. The one thing to take away from this, though, is uh, after Garu got beaten in that S-Class rank, and specifically when uh, his eye burst, and he's got, like, the red eye now, he um, ate a lot of food because he's constantly hungry as if his metabolism is going, like, into overdrive. When he gets into this fight with the two other monsters, he starts doing some superhuman stuff that uh, Mm. is more explicitly superhuman. Like, he gets stabbed in such a way that he should be dead, but he's not because uh, his... uh, something has awoken inside of him well you see he can move the organs yeah, inside of his body shut the fuck up <laughs> no we're not pulling it's a gag manga but seriously <laughs> shut the fuck up <laughs> well yeah garo gets carved up and then uh one of my favorite bits is he he looks like he's very dead as Taro is being captured for sadistic reasons. Because Japanese it, horror monster parody. Mm-hmm. Garo wakes up later that night and he's like, Ugh, how am I still alive? And, or, have my wounds stopped bleeding? I don't I can't tell if they've clotted or if my clothes have just stuck into them. Either way, I can't get my clothes off now, so I guess I'm just going to go beat up those monsters, I guess. Oh, yeah, because uh, <laughs> it's just like, hey, hey, boss, do you want me to change up Garo's design since he got slashed up so much? No, here's how. <laughs> They're now fused to my body because the Monster Association gave me a skin tight black leotard. And did they? Because <laughs> Gar- Garu's, uh, Garu's shirt now is his chest. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm not complaining. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not either. It well, we'll get to the um the attack on the Monster Association front door and uh the shocking amount of horny in those uh A-lister hero designs. We'll get there. But, we'll uh, get there. We we actually have a pretty uh pretty big thing for a uh, One Punch Man. Your hero is talking with Phoenix Man and Zombie Man happens to find the House of Evolution guy. Can I just say I really appreciate Zombie Man for just being like a completely separate genre to everything else One Punch Man does. <laughs> I love him so much. Full disclosure, I accidentally read further than we were supposed to, and I got to the thing that cemented Zombie Man as my favorite S-Class hero. <laughs> All right, then. Yeah, Z- Zombie Man has hunted down the House of Evolution, which is revealed he was built in. I think that got hinted at last uh, last time he showed up, but it's, it's just flat out said now. Mm. Unfortunately, the House of Evolution has become the House of Takoyaki. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Because now is the day where I will destroy the house of evolution. Big gorilla. What are you talking about? It got destroyed like a couple of months ago. What? What? We get the the doctor from that. Like, uh, I think it's the first actual arc in One Punch Man. But like yeah. um, where he's just like, yeah, no, I gave up because my entire thing was like artificially increasing power through like staged evolution. But um, when I, I met with Saitama and he fully cemented in my mind, that's not how our world works. There are inherent limits that are on people and they can't be broken. Yeah, it is something put in place by God. Like it is mm-hmm. a high unattainable thing. And I, I assumed I'll get as close as I can through science by like manipulating evolution to give someone as high base stats as you possibly can. Then Saitama showed up and I realized that man just has no limit. He willed himself into unbelievable strength. The way he phrases it and uh, Giro, uh, Giro Giro uh, explicitly states it is mm-hmm. there there are natural limits. There are a select few who do. Everyone's capable of it if they put the effort in that you can just remove the limiter. Mm-hmm. That, that mm-hmm. you can just open the floodgate and go on forever. Again, this is one of those ones where it's like one of the more serious moments from our first section of reading. Saitama has explained this to multiple people and nobody ever believes him. 
I just worked real yep. hard and just I got keep going. I think the scientist is the one who makes the classification of like, yeah, the S rank heroes have been born with like innate like superpowers and they're incredibly strong, but they've still got limits because they've just gotten to the top because like the things that they worked on, they either gave up on or like they thought they reached the top. When, when you start so high and you hit a wall, you assume that wall is all there is. Whereas like what mm -hmm. the main point of his entire thing is, Saitama is just a regular guy. It admittedly must have been very weak because he pushed his way through his limits on such a low amount. But for him, that was enough. Mm -hmm. And that's what's like, it was enough for him to give up his entire like multi-generational thought process of how to make things better because he's like, that's not how the world works. I was completely wrong. Yep. It is a comedically exaggerated illustration of something that you see in a lot of Shonen series where there are plateau. You keep working until you hit a wall and then you climb that wall. You know, I mean, like the the, the joke here is regular no powers guy climbs a wall and suddenly he insta wins everything by default. But it's it's similar to the to the way a lot of like uh, Shonen series will like uh, pace out like their power progression. Yoro Yoro is explaining to Phoenix Man. Yeah, I actually created Orochi. Yoro Yoro kind of has come to the same conclusion about the nature of, you know, limiters and whatnot. But rather than the philosophy of just it, or it's sort of parallel. The philosophy that Saitama had was just keep pushing through. Yoro Yoro says, uh, if you find someone strong enough of will that they can survive multiple body and soul shattering experiences, they can grow exponentially. And that's what I did with Orochi. I found someone who had violence in their heart and I put them through the absolute ringer. It took hundreds and thousands of failed experiments and dead monsters, but I got my monster king. I think Garo can beat him. And we also get from him uh, some explanation that there had been a couple of monsters popping up that like came from the natural world, like, you know, pollution or alien power, you know, like alien biology or something like that. Some of the monsters have been natural, but I saw these things breaking the natural limits on living things. And I'm like, and, and he says, so I took that and I kept doing it to every uh every even mildly extraordinary being I could find until I found someone that, you know, just kept going forever. And I'm going to do it again with Garo. That's the reason why I sent people after him I knew would want to kill him and, and gave him, them orders not to kill him. Uh, I wanted them to defy my orders and push Garo beyond the brink of death because either he dies and he wasn't ever worthy or he'll get up again and reach that next stage of power. Which is a um, shockingly serious amount of like world building and lore explanation and theme exploration to do just so much of with One Punch Man. So we have to throw in a little gag where uh, Zombie Man asks uh, Mr. Scientist Man, so what, this guy didn't give up anything for this immense power? Oh no, he gave up a lot. For what? For one, he's completely bald. Really? <laughs> and he also suffers from a crushing isolation. Okay, I don't believe this for a minute. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, the second one is actually true and actually a genuine sacrifice, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it, it also has uh, one of my um, favorite bits here when uh, Giro Giro at the end is just like, because um, I think Phoenix Man said something along the line of like, why are you making such a powerful monster anyway? And he goes like, well, we don't know if the Hero Association has any secrets up their hands, too. They might even have someone above S class. And then we get a nice little thin panel of uh, like round face Saitama just looking up at the panel above him. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. He's just like, oh, somebody say my name. <laughs> but uh, Garo just yeah. almost got killed by some Monster Association people. So he's uh, not really on Team Monster Association anymore and thinks it sucks as much as the Hero Association. So he's going to go uh, break it up. <laughs> 
To be fair, he's not wrong. Meanwhile, everybody else is occupied with a hot pot. Yeah, Dr. Kurusino uh, is like, thank you for uh, becoming uh, Genos's master. I'm certain he will go far under your tutelage. Now, go away. As thanks, I brought you this extremely expensive, high-quality prime beef. Dr. Kurusino, as Genos's mentors, we have much to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> And Blizzard is very angry about this because she had just returned from getting stuck with the bill for Saitama's diner meal. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she gets even angrier because he decides to use this uh, extremely expensive beef for hot pot. Yep. Do you even have any red wine? What? No, of course I don't. <laughs> oh, man. So that, that's a fun bit. Uh, another beautiful two page spread of them over the hot pot like, oh, <laughs> pondering the or pondering the pot <laughs> that is all uh, secondary as the uh the garo power hour continues <laughs> yeah he uh he instantly finds his way into the monster association's underground network of caves and just starts heading uh to be fair he did walk out of it yeah fair he i i'm not claiming that i'm just uh yeah. like there's a lot there's a lot for it to go unnoticed completely <laughs> It's Gar mm -hmm. Garo makes more sense than everyone, but um, <laughs> everything's relative. It's because he's the protagonist of a more serious manga. <laughs> Seriously, you really do be <laughs> like one of the things I was thinking of is if One Punch Man had a spinoff that was like Garo's journey and it wasn't a gag manga, I'd read that. In all fairness, Garo's parts are the least gag, uh, gag manga. Gag manga -y. Yeah, no, I mean, they almost feel like a different series. Mm hmm. But um, because uh, Garo's here, he's got to run into uh, his uh, little whiny kid, uh, which I believe he saved from King the Ripper. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 King the Ripper he, was he, about to take him away to do torturous crap. And uh, well, actually he does take him away, takes him to his room and is about to do uh, unsavory things with blades and whatnot. And then Garo punches the wall in and one and one shots him. Oh, dude, you came to save me. What? No, I came here for revenge. <laughs> I'm leaving now. Can I follow you? Uh, just yes, just keep up. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope you like walking around square tunnels. Because uh, <laughs> that, that's going to be the rest of this reading. If, uh, <laughs> if uh, not just the rest of this reading. Uh, <laughs> if um, oh. if uh, you uh, like not having any idea where anyone is and having people enter scenes by punching through walls, um, Monster Association has a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> I admittedly do like that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, the, the people entering scenes by punching through walls bit. <laughs> That's the most important one. We, we really stretched the limits of believability as if we didn't already with everything else in this manga about just how deep does their hideout go? <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure at least four separate times uh, 20 story deep holes get blown further and further down. Considering Orochi himself is 20 stories tall and presumably can walk around this thing. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, how does he get in and out of that antechamber? Because I don't think that's ever been explained. We see a method of it. Yeah. But uh, that comes as Garo is beating his way through more monsters. and Because they do know the... he's there. They don't know that it's him, but... They're, they're just going after the intruder. And they're like, oh, hey, it's Garo. Get him. Ah, we're dead. And that repeats uh, up until the fighting attracts the attention of what I am positive is jake's favorite character is big doggo i love him <laughs> yep <laughs> oh boy yeah. i would give him the pets I, I we don't even know if he's soft we don't even know well he's a doggo and he deserves the pets so even if he's not soft i would give him the pets okay uh, overgrown poochie threat level dragon i love how um <laughs> his name is literally overgrown poochie <laughs> I love how when they, because uh, apparently he's the leader, because they run into some other people and ask about him, and it's just like, he's the boss. He appears to be a dog. Are you saying dogs can't be the do can't be the boss? I'm That's saying he has the intelligence of a dog. Yeah, the Monster Association doesn't really assign leadership ranks based on, you know, intelligence. They assign it based on pure destructive capability. So we're led by an animal. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, <laughs> parallels between the Hero and Monster Associations. This is another case where they're writing the uh, quiet part very much out loud. Poochie doesn't seem 
too overly concerned with them in in the moment <laughs> until the fighting uh basically gets a thorn in its paw yeah like and a then rock just... flies and and bumps it and suddenly and then we discover that um this humongous shadow six-eyed dog thing fires lasers <laughs> i mean yes we couldn't get any better firing in my lasers it's basically a dragon it just has a big breath weapon <laughs> It's it's part dragon, part dog. Like it, like how how do you create a more perfect life form? And all chaos, and it's really cool. Garo, in the process of fighting it, actually looks like he's about to die because he Again. underestimate he underestimates the recharge time of the breath weapon. Gets in close for to like punch the thing up so that Tara can escape and. Um, humongous breath beam move and he's like wait no that that wasn't supposed to happen yet and as he's going out looking like bardock uh, <laughs> as if as if garo wasn't enough of a dragon ball c reference already a massive panel of him basically blurred out in white light going this is stupid i don't want to die i can't die here i haven't reached my full potential yet i want to drink cola again but there's no way i can get out of this and then tiny little panel at the bottom of a very small Garo sitting in front of the TV, cheering on the monsters mm-hmm. in the report of a hero fight. And he stands up from the rubble. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is also the part where uh, we get uh, basically the the extremely heavy implication that uh, Giro Giro uh, Giro 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 Giro. The, 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 the Cyclops, the Cyclops tentacle monster. Um, that Giro, guy Giro, Giro, Giro? is. That guy is specifically the boss. Like he outright states it at this point. He explains that uh, to Garo's face exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. If you train with me, I can make you stronger than Orochi. Train with you? That sounds like stupid. (laughs) I'm not doing that. Actually, uh, I I guess I should uh, clarify here. Um, we, we do get a flashback of Orochi in this uh, fight, um, which does kind of uh, reveal you've been misgendering Garo Garo. Uh, it's she. Uh, oh, I missed that. Yep. Uh, it's, I... uh, her, her face is masked, but it is a woman scientist. OK. Oh, yeah. Which that's... actually could very well just be a disguise they're using. But if you have to wager a guess. Uh, yeah, I, I OK, I will. I will uh, amend that's then. True. I miss that. I will freely admit the the last couple of chapters that I read, I had to read quickly to get them done on time. <laughs> Wait. So Wait. some little details I may have missed. Sorry for misgendering the giant psychic monster. Yes, obviously. The giant, the giant psychic uh, cyclops tentacle monster. You. You got it. You got anything else for that, Jay? <laughs> now I'm just listening to Matt Cackle. And- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh so anyway uh now we get a fight between uh garo and orochi i mean kind of it's mostly orochi's horns but it's still really cool because orochi's horns are prehensile and extendable and stab the absolute hell out of garo <laughs> hey thanks i needed some fresh holes garo why why would you say that? <laughs> because here's the thing, Matt. Here's what you don't understand. You call that guy the king of monsters because he's the biggest and the strongest, but he just doesn't have enough. He just isn't enough. Isn't enough what? Scary. He doesn't instill enough fear like a good monster should. So to show you what real fear is. <laughs> And he gets smashed into a wall. Yeah, there, there's a lot of really good moments of the things that Garo has been doing. He's fully met his match, uh, at least thus far, in Orochi. Because one of the other things that he mentions is you might have more brute strength than me, but my martial arts, is because I've uh, gained the abilities of so many people, my martial arts can actually work on uh, non-human opponents. So I'll show you the power of technique, at which point Orochi... Uh, copies Garo's stance, not just with his arms, but also with all of his horns, which was really cool. <laughs> Anything you can do, I can do 40 times over. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I I believe that conflict uh, circa our reading had been left on a cliffhanger. 
because I think that's uh, as far as that goes. Garo starts scrambling through the the um like because it's like a big multi tiered arena, and he got mm. hit into the wall, and he starts running along the edge at that point because he's like, well, this is. I'm clearly weaker than him, and he starts just massacring monsters in his way, but he's he's retreating, I think, as far as our reading went. That's one of the big things that's been happening, because um, whilst he was saving the little boy, uh, one thing that uh, Garo has taken to doing is he has started killing not humans, but monsters, and he is also perfectly willing to eat them. Yum, Which, yum, yum. again... He needs the protein. <laughs> he needs the protein. Yeah, and that sort of goes into the whole, um, one of the reasons why I find Garo so compelling is I want to see him become the hero he's obviously meant to be, but there is a legit chance that his story is going to end in tragedy. And, uh, you know, I, I'm worried about, uh, you know, I'm worried about his ultimate fate because I'm invested in him and he does not have the plot armor that uh, Saitama or even someone like Genos has. Yeah, Garo is defeated by Orochi and uh, left unconscious and now in the custody of the Monster Association again. Well, it's not and, like uh, he wants to really be there. And uh, now is when we finally come to the end of the Garo Power Hour. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> Don't worry, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> now we return to your regularly scheduled One Punch Man. <laughs> I mean, kind of. Garo with his with his. 207th second wind his zenkai boosts his he's explicitly getting zenkai boosts actually no he's getting better than zenkai boosts because one of the important things about zenkai boosts is you're supposed to heal before you actually get the power up <laughs> garo is just getting back up and willing himself to full health i do compare garo to dragon ball in a loving and favorable way it it, it needs be noted uh in case anyone misconstrued <laughs> Mm -hmm. he, he is a unique uh, and loving homage to one of my favorite franchises of all time, and I am all about it. <laughs> and therefore, we love him. We have to get back to that whole, oh yeah, saving the hostage thing. Didn't didn't Yorogiro give the Hero Association like three days from the attack? I want to say 48 hours, but yeah, maybe it's... I thought three days is what was mentioned, but uh, timelines in One Punch Man, they're a thing that don't exist. Anyway, we, we skip 12 hours from the human perspective because um, King gets knocked out in the big fight over who gets what piece of the hot pot. And <laughs> from our perspective, we wake up with him the next day after everyone's been kicked out. And Saitama's is like, hey, freeloader, everyone else went home. Take out the trash for me. <laughs> they have such a genuine friend moment because King genuinely apologizes for being a freeloader. And he's like, ah, eh, whatever, just take the trash out and water under the bridge. Like they, yeah. those two are such legitimately good friends. I love their friendship. King takes the trash out. He goes under a fence, a nearby jogger is like, hey, were you sneaking through that fence into the abandoned district? No, you didn't see anything. Okay, I just gotta get out of here. Hopefully no one from the Hero Association shows up. And King, we've been looking everywhere for you. What happened to you? We didn't get anything from your transmitter. Why are your clothes all dirty? Is that blood? Oh, well, it's, it's hot pot. No, it's blood. <laughs> You were in, I bet you were holding off the Monster Association all by yourself. Well, we're terribly sorry to stop you from getting your well-deserved rest, but we need you back at headquarters. Come on. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> in that tone of voice. <laughs> and it's so great funny. because we get introduced to basically all of the S-Class heroes, which we kind of did last time. But I think uh, Child Emperor in particular, we get like to actually know something about. Hmm. Because I think Child Emperor last time said they weren't interested in participating in the thing. And that, this time they're basically spearheading it. Everyone shows up and they're all just bickering because they're all like divas, essentially. Uh, they're all incredibly full of themselves, spe especially Tatsumaki. Specifically, Genos and Silverfang are being explicitly excluded from this because the Hero Association knows um, Garo works for the Monster Association and doesn't trust Silverfang to actually take him out. So and they're not sending him at all. Metal Knight had said uh, something to Child Emperor when Child Emperor was trying to get Metal Knight to participate. He's like, there is a reason why I'm not doing this. I did a probing attack and got completely screwed over. They have information that they shouldn't. Don't trust anybody. Losing a hostage sucks. But if you go in now, it's going to go badly. I advise, and I'm not going to waste my own resources, I advise calming down, waiting, 
and making a move on our own terms as opposed to making the attack. But if you are committed to this, don't trust anybody because Garo makes things complicated and the Monster Association shouldn't even exist in the first place. Mm -hmm. And um, because the S-Class is down a few members because they're not invited, uh, my mask is being invited as honorary S-Class top of A rank. Mm. Because um, like no one, well, everyone acknowledges that he could be S class if he mm, so chose. Yeah, because he well, he explicitly turns down promotion into S class. Well, specifically, they're putting together a support team to cover the surface while the uh, S class heroes go underground because they know the Monster Association hideout is underground. And uh, my mask was supposed to be the leader of the support team until he found out about this, became a diva, and said, "What do you mean you're leaving me on the surface? I'm going down there with you, you bitches." Yes. <laughs> that never really gets resolved because King shows up. Oh, because they're just fighting. It, it's some great comedy. It's back and forth fighting about who should be in control. Tatsumaki basically is like, I'm rank two. I'm going to just kill all the strong things. You just like stand by Clean in my way. Yeah. Ta like, Tatsumaki is a sketched gremlin the entire time. <laughs> yeah, because everyone keeps ignoring her because she's a gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But uh, essentially, the main joke of this is King walks into the stage and all these people who had been fighting over incredibly petty things, ready to start a fight over nothing. See King walk into the room drenched in hot pot sauce and have uh, the announcement go like, because my mask comes up like, you're filthy. What's going on here? And the guy just talks to King. He's like, hey, he has been had hot pot last he, night. No, he has been fighting in centers in City Z all night. He hasn't even slept and he had to come back for this meeting. And my mask is like, now that's what a hero should be. I'm going to concede to whatever you want, but only because King's so cool. And then everyone said King was so cool, and they all liked him and wanted to be his friend. He's really the opposite Saitama. See He's the anti-Saitama! Hear how much the King engine is rumbling? He's getting ready for battle. <laughs> or something. Definitely or something. something. Oh, and it's... The best part about this is because it's like a strike team um, and because they think King had already been doing all the fighting, they basically give him an entire wing of the Monster Association that he has to handle on his own. He's like, oh, no. Oh, he hides in a bathroom and calls in the calls in the uh, people who had been left out. <laughs> well, no, he he wanders into uh a meeting room so that he can get away from everybody and he sees uh bang and bomb explains the situation to them and he's like okay silver fang i want you demon cyborg and bald cape to go in with me why can't you handle it well obviously i could but it's and, and, and besides you you have a personal stake in this don't you i i know demon cyborg does you know what? You're right. I will gladly accept. And I know the others will, too. Oh, thank God. We're going to have some time in here. It'll be fine. <laughs> Unfortunately, they can't find Saitama. <laughs> yeah, they go they back. They go back and they find Blizzard was going to be. She's gone up to A rank, so she was going to be part of the support team. But uh, Tatsumaki explicitly forbid her sister from being involved in this because it was too dangerous. Mm -hmm. And um, so she got left out, too. Yeah, and essentially why all this has been going on, um, Saitama heard the noise of Garu fighting Orochi and thought it was an earthquake, put on his outfit to go patrolling, and then wound up in the Monster Association by accident by just like, huh, I wonder what that sound was. Checking out the sewer. Because Saitama. Yeah, yep. but they can't find him because he's gone. So when um, King is then tasked to, like, the team's getting ready to go, he's just like, oh, um, well, are we going to wait for Saitama? Yes, we should wait for Saitama. No, I'll wait for no. Saitama. King, you go on alone. What? What? No. <laughs> Silver Fang, don't worry, I'll come with you. <laughs> oh, okay, that's yeah. so pretty good, but now I don't have Genos or Saitama. Ah! <laughs> the King engine is revving up. <laughs> <laughs> and um we basically uh get to the final bit of our reading where um the a rank squad gets uh together and they are marching through city z as their big old platoon and oh marada i my heart goes out to you because every single one of these faceless monster designs is unique uh -huh. they're not repeated uh-huh 
It's insane. Murata is an absolute madman, and I as respect like, him so much. <laughs> it's an ambush as this weird, like, tentacle lich thing comes it, out. It's death from the Castlevania games. Yeah, and it's it's made of the eyes of every single monster slayed by the, the Hero Association. And, like, so much of this is just giving all these A-ranks, like, monsters to kill. And it's really cool. And the takeaway, I think, is, is that, like, all of the A-ranks that are featured are, like, the exact same type of power type as a, one of the S-ranks. Just mm -hmm. the S-rank is so much better than them at it. So it's it's them outshining. Yeah. And it's uh, like we it's like we've got Atomic Samurai and explicitly his disciples, which is the mm -hmm. most one to one of this. But mm -hmm. we also have like um, I forget her name, but track and field girl. I love track and field girl so much. <laughs> I love track and field girl because uh, she, her whole thing is she's just extremely, extremely buff and athletic. And she uses track and field events to kill monsters as, by as her as her combat style and in and in one of the most like poorly thought out matchups <laughs> i could possibly think this <laughs> woman with incredibly monster <laughs> this woman with incredibly muscular thighs is paired up against two watermelon monsters i oh I, yes <laughs> i screen tapped that and sent it to the group and i said i have never seen someone counterpick themselves so hard and considering my reaction to that i'm surprised that was what sam mentioned uh circa <laughs> that page <laughs> though he did promptly agree with me which fair because i mean uh-huh because if, if, I, if i had to wager a bet uh marada might have another favorite to draw <laughs> <laughs> i'd yeah. be okay with her showing up again <laughs> look there's an awful lot of shots that just show glorious framing of her ass so <laughs> <laughs> can we talk about my favorite guy who is um a rank Man? hero what Bondage Man's pretty good, actually. Bondage Man is just a dude who's into bondage. He's, uh, he's just a really hot guy who wears uh, who wears a bondage harness and wraps up monsters. Yep, I'm okay. listening. I have a feeling that uh, his arch rival is going to be the uh, yes, the BDSM yes. lady monster. <laughs> Yes, uh, that will please. be a battle of the ages. I, I was I was gonna mention my dude who um one of the monsters has like a monster sniper rifle and is going to take out the, the A ranks when the S ranks are distracted by falling oh, yeah. rubble because Tatsumaki breaks some stuff and is more of a and doesn't hindrance. care about Tatsumaki yeah. is honestly more of a hindrance to the mission at this point than a help, but yeah. um. Um, is um, he's going to snipe him out, but he is counter sniped by dude whose power is he has a sniper rifle. <laughs> I love one shotter so much. Man is out here playing risk of rain, jumping around, blasting monsters with his sniper rifle until it jams and he has to hide uh, behind Pooty Pooty Prisoner. But before he does, he's got one of my favorite lines was you thought that being close range would uh, hamper me at all. I'm a true sniper <laughs> and then proceeds to is like Harkonnen from Helsing. He <laughs> <laughs> Extremely rapid fire reloading back flipping over. My he's he's out here playing risk of rain. I love it. <laughs> yes. And then immediately like goes chicken shit. <laughs> <laughs> with his gun jams <laughs> oh no my only I, weakness lack of gun <laughs> he's got a little catchphrase of it is what it is like even as he's got this panicked expression he's like i accept it <laughs> uh putty putty prisoner was also great in this <laughs> there's like a whole thing about how normally you would uh illegally escape to go do hero work which just raises so many questions as it is meant to do. Uh, but this time we're letting you out on a work furlough. <laughs> I died. Because one of the monsters broke into the prison and prison and monsterized a whole bunch of the prisoners. I need you to go avenge them, putty putty prisoner. <laughs> yes, sir, warden. And then one of the one of the other prisoners, we hand knit you this sweater. May it give you courage. Oh, that's so sweet, man. You may now fall for me, boys. And they are at the other end of the street. That's too far back. <laughs> oh, fall back, guys. Fall back. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of cool stuff. It's 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 just one really long fight scene of a whole bunch of people, <laughs> and the S ranks kind of playing a supporting role to like 
kind of tease what they're going to do in the dungeon because the A ranks are not coming with. The A ranks are doing everything they can right now. Uh, but unfortunately, yeah. a, the A ranks need to be taught that they are not strong enough because out from the dungeon, after all of the like nameless mooks come out and the one boss that Tatsumaki kills without a second thought, um, we get Rhino Man. Rhino Wrestler! <laughs> who... You don't need good matchups when you're as strong as me. My favorite gimmick about him is he is one shotting the A ranks and like knocking them down and grading their performance. The best one is uh, EIE in uh, Disciple of Atomic Samurai, who gets a 69 nice on his attack. <laughs> but then Atomic Samurai himself walks up, says, show me your motivation and cubes. <laughs> this this rhino he, he, into a- like the way that it's paneled he just walks up to rhino wrestler does the like little like click with the thumb to get the sword out of the sheath and then turns around this is already over what what do you mean and then atomic samurai uh looks back over his shoulder oh that's right i forgot something what do you grade my attack and then as rhino wrestler is cubed and falling to the ground 100 and then he just unleashes the judgment cut and finishes off a whole bunch of other monsters. It's so good. You love two panel spreads of things getting eviscerated. Uh, Atomic Samurai has, I think it's three in a row where it's cubed. Then he cubes the cubes and then they are an indiscernible splash of blood. He's just Virgil. It's so cool. <laughs> but uh, they finish off the welcome wagon of monsters and start heading down and uh, this is where we enter our uh, final uh, bit of the reading, where we get precisely one S rank hero fight. And I freaking loved it because I love high speed shenanigans like this. It's Flashy Flash versus the monsterized ninjas Hellfire Flame and Tempest Wind. And this is such a case where like they built up Hellfire Flame and Tempest Wind so much. And like not to say that it, it was like a gag let down, but like, you know, it, it was one of those ones where it's like you get a cool ninja fight, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And it's great because they started off with like they're pretending to still be humans while fighting um, Flashy Flash. And they're like, yeah, we were sent by this guy to kill you. And then they just go down the list of people they could employ because each time they mention a name, um, Flashy Flash is like, that's not true. I killed him, killed him, killed him, killed, <laughs> killed them. They're dead, killed them, killed them. Killed. And Bottom, they're like bottom of the ocean. I remember that guy killed him, too. What? And then Flash Flash just goes like, yeah, uh, while I'm a hero, I'm also a ninja. So I killed literally everyone I thought who could kill me. Mm-hmm. But I mean, wasn't it implied that they also were, well, they were sent specifically after him. It wasn't just like unprovoked, wasn't it? They, they were saying they were bringing up a bunch of human employers. Uh, th- their employer is very obviously uh, Giro Giro who yeah. gave them the monster cells, but they weren't telling him that. They were because... they were pretending to be human and mm-hmm. claiming they had human employ when really... When really... They were monsters. When really, they were trying to get the jump on him was what they were doing by revealing they had monster powers as like a surprise because they're ninjas. They keep everything hidden up until they don't have to. Uh, and mm-hmm. they were like, well, then why'd you do it? And they're like, well, we just wanted to be strong. And now we can... We wanted to be stronger than you, Flashy Flash. The entire time, it's just zipping around everywhere. It's cool ninja shenanigans, and it's a really cool fight. And it just ends with them just being, like, defeated and Flashy Flash just going away. And they're like, what What could we have done? And the entire time, Flashy Flash just been saying, like, dude, just work hard. Just learn. And, like, it's like... It ends with just such a cool line you of like did more training. Yep. You you should have just worked harder rather than just taking the easy route that clearly didn't work for you. Part of the part of the hot pot thing was when Genos asks why he lost again to Saitama. Saitama's like, I don't know, work harder, get stronger. I don't know. Maybe you need more power. Yes, this is very good. I will take this under account. And King's like, no, Geno, Saitama's not actually a good role model. <laughs> My favorite part of the end of the uh, flashy flash fight is um, after they enter their monster forms and become threat level dragon, there is a bit where they basically pinball around the entire chamber. This is a good way of exploiting the fact that manga is sequential art because everything is all still images, so it all looks frozen in time. Then Flashy Flash gets the double kill because he had just been trying to set up to get them both at the same time. And 
uh, he sheaths his sword and walks away. And then every point where they pinballed, including the bridge they ripped through, explodes because that was all done before anything broke. Mm hmm. I loved that so much. It's it's such a cheap way. Of, not not exactly. Or it's such a it's well economical way. Of, yeah, it's such an economical, like well worn way of doing it. But it hit every time for me. <laughs> oh, it was um, my favorite part of the flashy flash fight. Was after the ninja fight, he is walking into the hallway, and we get a panel of the um, tracker. He had on him getting smashed in the fight, and he's like, oh, "No, it's sin- it's sinking into the lake mm-hmm. at the bottom of the of the place where he was fighting." Because he was gonna pull the map that's in the uh, tracker out, and he's like, "Wait, where did it go?" And then it cuts to it sinking into the lake. I'm sure that's not going to affect him at all. <laughs> <laughs> As he just chooses a random direction and goes. Look, whenever he's needed in a scene, he can just smash through the nearest wall, and he'll be right there. <laughs> That's not precisely where we end. We uh, end on our our final chapter where Child Emperor, in the part that gave me the most stress, (laughs) (laughs) is is just an actual child wandering around this place being approached by monsters with a lollipop in his backpack. And um, it's got that framing that you get in a horror movie. Like, you know, the one it's the over the shot shoulder of a kid walking down a hallway and you it's showing you just enough to know how dark and gloomy and so many hiding places that that there are and there's so much potential space for danger to come from and he's so small he baby and monster leaps out at him and gets shot to death by an octopus auto turret <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> right this is an s-class hero <laughs> whose entire thing is uh lethal gadgets that look like toys <laughs> he he is kevin McAllister to the ten thousandth degree <laughs> He is able to successfully locate the hostage and is on the way escorting him out. Oh, uh, though, important. Mean before he found the hostage, he did run into Phoenix Man, who said that his monster origin is that he was once a character actor in a suit and he could never take the suit off. And then, um... Child Emperor kills him. They had a whole thing about how like there was this like it's one of those ones where it's like there'd be like uh, an animated form. There'd be the dramatic stills of each of the characters before the big battle, you know, speaking their motivations internally. And we got one about him, about how I will be the next Monster King. And now he's not around anymore. (laughs) I read further ahead. Sam, shut up. (laughs) I will shut up. (laughs) It's really it's really cool, though. It is really cool how they spent all that time um, bringing up a monster called Phoenix Man. And then he died. Yeah. And then he died. OK. Anyway, uh, anyway, Child Emperor has the hostage. I'm sure this will be over in a jiffy. Uh, that concludes our reading, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, not good night. And we still have our discussion. <laughs> we got to the point where they have entered the Monster Association. So they are in the tunnels for... A while. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I have heard things about the pacing. What I have discovered uh, via meme osmosis is uh, the fan base getting a little annoyed about how um, Dark Luster Shine, Black Luster Soldier, whatever his friggin' name is, <laughs> just gets in a just gets in a JoJo posing fight with a guy for like ten chapters. Yeah, or something. yeah, that was a pretty good fight. <laughs> They're just flexing at each other for like a year of releasing. Because he's a defense-based uh, hero, so he fights a defense-based monster. And it goes like the Metapod fight from Pokemon. <laughs> oh, oh, wow, fun. That's, so So that's something uh, to look forward to. I, I feel like we could probably do uh, One Punch Man more than once a year, but at the very least, uh, you know, After something to... a bit of a break. Something to uh, look forward to next time... Uh, the series comes around but um as Indeed. as we uh, always do with shonens uh let's uh let's get into the discussion uh favorite character favorite fight uh sam why don't you go oh boy it's kind of hard to say um like obviously garo it was amazing the garo power hour was a ton of fun and i want to see more of him i am very invested in his in his story i love characters that just really they're this close to getting it you know just a little bit more if he put in 
extra iota of thought into it, he'd be like, oh, I'm just mad at the injustice of society, but I'm still basically intrinsically a hero. But he doesn't. And seeing him continue to eke his way towards that in a whole bunch of rad anime fights is my jam. So he's absolutely top contender. Um, I, I, I really don't think um, anybody else comes too close except maybe king just for the comedy angle king was very funny in this my favorite my, <laughs> my favorite jealous bickering couple of genos and blizzard <laughs> i loved all their interactions because it's just the two of them <laughs> getting it it's just genos being sundere for um saitama oh no and no, no. I- I, I see them as like two kids going like, no, dad loves me more. No, dad loves me more. <laughs> basically, basically, basically. But yeah, uh, despite how much I love all those characters, I think Garo does have to take it. As for favorite fight, God, if Flashy Flash versus the Monster Ninjas. I I love high speed fights. <laughs> so I love fights of mint that flings them all over a huge arena. It was a big waterfall cavern, which is absolutely my aesthetic. So uh, I love that one. I just blared play the hero from the Guilty Gear Strive OST the whole time. <laughs> so yeah, that one that one uh, easily takes favorite fight for me. Okay. Uh, Jacob, uh, favorite character, favorite fight? Okay, this is so unbelievably completely easy for me. 100% Garo was 10 billion percent my Shonen Trash. Perfectly crystallized. I love everything about Garo. All the stuff that I mentioned about like, because like one of the really cool things is without breaking the tone of the series overall, at least not yet, his story is taken seriously both internally and externally. So that's what I gravitate to. And um, again, like the idea that like the thing that I think I find most compelling about Garo is actually similar to uh, back in our most recent Demon Slayer episode, things that I mentioned about Nezuko. Despite knowing that Nezuko has the plot armor that nothing permanent could really happen to her, I was still scared that like, is it going to go too far? The thing is, Garo doesn't have the protection a character like Nezuko has. Garo's story could legitimately end tragic, and that might be, you know, the way it ends for him. And I am really invested in seeing uh, whether or not, you know, because, again, I really want him to be the hero he's obviously meant to be. But... You know, he's taken many steps toward that. He's also taken, especially in the last couple of chapters we saw him in, he's taken some pretty serious steps away from it. And that is just so uh, gripping for me personally. As for favorite fight, um, this one is also actually really easy because I've mentioned a lot that I like speed. I like movement in uh, my fights. But the one thing that tops that for me is an expression of martial prowess. And whilst... Basically, everything involving Garo and everything involving Flashy Flash and everything involving Atomic Samurai all fall into that category. The one that showed it off the best by far was Garo versus the A rank heroes, because just martial skill expressed in sequential art was so visually captivating that I could not, you know, set it down until that fight had been entirely concluded. Very good choice. Uh, Jay, what about you? Uh, favorite character and favorite fight? Sure, a bit of a tough act to follow, but um, <laughs> I'll have to say Garu. It was a complete package. Primary uh, character development and a good show. Good plot development. Um, That's what they're calling it now. Plot, 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 plot. Juicy plot. Um, <laughs> so much plot. Yes. Um, favorite fight, however, I would have to say it's hard for me to categorize fights because for for me, at least, they kind of really dragged on a lot. So uh, there were points where I kind of became bored and irritated. But as for finishing moves, I would definitely have to say it would be a tie between finishing punch by mm-hmm. Saitama and... Sent to um, kind of really enjoy the negging by King. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously uh, Atomic Samurai, that was, I honestly was not expecting that. And I had to re- revisit that confrontation like four times to process what happened. 
<laughs> it's too fast even for the reader. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. Oh man, choice. That, that one was super really cool. Uh Matt, favorite character, favorite fight? Oh man. I mean Garo's hard not to say, but um, I don't know. Uh, I'll I'll go a different direction. Um, I really like of the Monster Association. Um, Giro Giro in this uh, it has that great like what I love is a villain sitting behind the scenes and also gloating a little and like really cementing like you get that full puppet master thing, which um, just coming off really nice. Yeah. And she pulls it off, too. Like, it's not done as a joke. She really mm-hmm. feels like a real no, puppet no, you master. you believe like they're in control, like it's mm-hmm. like things are being done and it's like. That's really cool. Um, yeah. Zombie Man, I just love because it's, every time Zombie Man's in anything, they feel like they're in a completely different genre. <laughs> and uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my particular trash. Uh, I love the one incredibly handsome A rank hero uh, who isn't oh. a My Mask. <laughs> oh my God. You mean. Uh... You mean I can't stop sparkling? Yeah, I can't stop sparkling because he's like my mask, except his power is he looks handsome and then beats someone to death with a cinder block and then does a handsome <laughs> pose. And I love that bit so much. And then they're examining like what their powers are. He's just like, oh, I don't really do any. I'm just great. Power, his power is he beats someone to death with a cinder block. <laughs> I wish I had that power. <laughs> Well, Jay, you can. <laughs> you see, Jay, if you work every day and push past your limits, you too can commit homicide with a cinder block. <laughs> do not do this. The Overmanga cast, <laughs> the Overmanga cast does not condone murder. The Overmanga cast does not condone going down to Home Depot and paying five dollars for a cinder block, and then destroying the receipt to show no proof of you owning said cinder block. <laughs> We do not condone that. <laughs> this episode has gone in a completely different direction than I was expecting. I really like the A-rank fight where all the, the cool A-rankers are doing their show-off bits and Tatsumaki. Like, it's just a good team fight. It is, yeah. I think that's a good sampling of all of the good fights over the course of this. It had the, the thing I love in One Punch Man, which is the like, wait, is there seriously someone who that's their fighting technique? Oh, my God. They're clearly a joke character, but Murata's art makes this just legitimate and you feel like it's real. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean she just does track and field events? Holy crap. She she hammered through that guy through like another 12 guys. <laughs> it's working. So if it's stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. But yeah, um, with uh, with this arc, uh, do h- how do we feel about uh, One Punch Man uh, stepping out of being pure parody into uh, more of a serious plot structure? Honestly, I think the fact that we split this reading over the course of a year has colored this in a way for me. I think that if I was reading this, you know, month to month or however frequently it came out, if I was a regular up to date reader, it would feel a little off for me. If you go back and listen to the first episode, we're laughing a ton because that is the highest comedy bit. And we laughed a lot in this, too, because it's not devoid of gags. But there's definitely uh, greater um, gaps between them, between the, the comedy beats, instead of just one after another, after another, after another. And if that's what I first got into One Punch Man for, I would be a little bit annoyed. But going into this... Having, you know, read the first bit and we did all our philosophizing in episode one. Go back and listen to it, except don't. It sounds terrible. Uh, Sam, don't tell people not to listen to our podcast. Uh, I am the editor. I'm allowed to be embarrassed. I like that episode as messy as it was. The great thing about One Punch Man is that it does have more to say than just being a gag parody manga. And the fact that one is leaning into that, I am thankful for and so i'm happy with it i can understand how somebody would be jarred by it or say that it has gone away from the thing that they were enjoying but i am absolutely here for more of garo talking about the philosophy of what makes a monster how much fear they can inflict and then you know probably getting raffle stomped because (laughs) because that's his life right now because that's his life right now. Uh, Matt, uh, considering you've uh, had the most experience with this series, what's your take on the, uh, it's hard to say tonal shift, but, you know. 
That's the thing. I'm I'm not even sure it's a hundred percent a tonal shift. Like, cause I I think what's happened is the parody has just been like less on the surface. Cause there's still an inherent like ridiculousness to it all. I think the one thing that really has changed is it's starting. It it takes its internal logic seriously. Like we have a whole lore dump about how what limits are by two mm. separate characters, which is I, I'm assuming to reinforce this isn't one person like philosophizing. This is probably a at least or pretty a monster real... lying either yeah. like this is probably the fact we've got two separate characters from different points saying essentially the same thing is like no this is something that we want to explore in this series this is a serious concept we're trying to explain saitama's power serious series yeah yeah serious <laughs> punch <laughs> and like i i feel like that's kind of necessary because otherwise i feel like after the martial arts tournament i i don't know what other joke you do with it like because the martial arts tournament the joke is he can't be too good which is like the full thing it's like where do you go from there other than let's give the s ranks some more showtime because it's clear people like the s ranks and it's clear they like cool fights saitama can't be in all the fights but does he need to be there? Because he's mostly fun as like the joke character who comes in and is the main character. Mm-hmm. And like his whole journey now is like coming to realize to like let people in and be less isolated. Yeah. Mm. Which we got a bit with the hot pot and how he's like, oh, now there's too many people in my house. I just want to be alone for a second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he needs like to find the good life balance. What about your take on all of this, Jay? I can see how you would be able to interpret a tonal shift, but I also think that I have to agree that the shift hasn't been all that um, severe. Um, I think that it's really just hit a nice stride because this, or at least our first reading, was all about establishing that rhythm of what it was going to be. Was it just going to be canned jokes and just tropes and everything? And now we're actually diving into, okay, what are we about and what what substance? Yes. Now that we have established an audience, now that we have established a following, now that we have people engaged, where are we taking them? Where are we Mm. taking this? There was a very particular reason why I uh, added this to our discussion topics, because I have... I have some very serious thoughts about this, you know, very serious series. The reason why I why my brain goes to tone shift is because Garo's story feels like not quite, but almost disconnected. And like that feels intentional. But like there is a separation between uh, Garo and Saitama's story. And it feels like Garo is being built into being another Saitama. You know, and like either he does that as a villain or he he becomes a hero and they're equals or something like that. I really one of the things I mentioned in uh, our first episode is if this was just the same big bad villain gets one shot by Saitama joke every single chapter, it would not have lasted as long as it did. And it would have gotten dull eventually. So the fact that it has something to say that the parody isn't just raw jokes, but the parody is actually you know, like actively satirizing both uh, manga tropes and elements of the real world, you know, and making commentary on it is is great in my opinion. But the thing that concerns me is I kind of don't want Saitama to go anywhere near Orochi because if all of this build up, because like there there is this sense that the idea that all of this serious stuff is basically just the build up to the punchline of it getting deflated if all of this buildup goes into Saitama just one-shots Orochi, that would be actively deflating, and at least for me personally, kinda ruin the series. It really does feel like this is building to a conclusion, whilst, you know, like, there's examples of, like, Saitama offhand backhands Garo, but, like, Garo's obviously not finished growing yet. There's gonna come a point when Garo is going to be presented to the audience as being on Saitama's level, And when that happens, I want to I don't want that to also, because it's the rules of the gag manga, see Saitama just one shot him again anyway. And that's sort of that's that's concern is too strong a word. I'm kind of hoping that One Punch Man is building to a conclusion rather than building to a punchline, particularly with Garo and Orochi. Now, obviously, I don't know if this has happened yet or not in the manga. Personally, the way I think that this would be a good way to kind of have the cake and eat it too, is it looks like Saitama is about to bust in and just uh, 
pulverize Orochi into the ground. But Garo actually finishes the big cool fight right before then. <laughs> right before Saitama can jump in and deflate the entire story. Yeah, that actually would yeah. be it. And it's like, and it's like Saitama hears about the Monster King, the most powerful. And he's like, ooh, this might actually be someone worthwhile. This might be what I hope Boros was. Oh, this is going to be good. And he gets there and Garo finishes him off. He's like, aw. And that being the joke, yeah, that's why that's why I say concern is too strong a word, because it's like I have faith in One Punch Man. I trust One Punch Man, but I can't help but, you know, be worried about that, you know? Yeah, it's not just the thing with anything you enjoy. You don't want to see it. You don't want to see bad things happen to it. I'm so bad about that. I'll get scared to watch a show I like because I'm afraid it will disappoint me. And it's so stupid. Listeners out there, read and watch the stuff that you like. If it disappoints you, that's sad, but it doesn't take away the fact that you enjoyed it up to that point. Like, <laughs> I mean, we could have <laughs> a whole discussion about that, but, you know. Future episode, maybe. But this episode has come to an end. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening again to the over manga cast if you want to follow us on social medias which you absolutely should to see our high quality posting then find at over manga cast on facebook twitter instagram we're also on youtube where that's a good place to leave comments on individual episodes you can like comment and subscribe uh also and, uh, leaving reviews on your podcatcher of choices very much appreciated it helps us out a lot if you guys have been listening to us uh, through All Out or, you know, been recently, a uh, nice birthday present for us. Uh, go leave a review. Mm -hmm. We greatly appreciate it. Honestly, a fun thing might be to do uh, is to listen to the first episode, listen to this one and see how far we've come, because it uh, <laughs> it it feels like it went by in a flash. But, uh, you know, flashy flash, <laughs> it's flash. Went by, it went by in a flashy flash. But uh, I feel like. Uh, <laughs> I feel like we've broken our limits and and uh, reached a new level of power. <laughs> ah, good. And you know what we should do with this new limits broken and this new level of power, Jacob? I, I think one girlfriend isn't appropriate for us anymore. <laughs> with Valentine's Day coming up, it's almost like we need 100 girlfriends who really, 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 really love you. Yeah, uh, we are going to be reading The 100 Girlfriends Who Really, 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 Really Love You. Uh, it's 100 Conjuro for short, because that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard our podcast title. You know we're not going to call it that. <laughs> <laughs> we are reading chapters 1 through 20 for uh, next week um, for Valentine's Day so, special. Happy anniversary to the podcast and have a good night, everybody. Good night. To another great year of podcasting. Good night.